So this is my little Piper, or Pip, as she's affectionately known. And I've chosen this photo today to show all of you um, that by simply looking at Piper and her beautiful little face, you can't possibly see or begin to imagine, sorry, is that screaming everyone's ears? Or begin to imagine the horrors and the trauma that she's been subjected to. And I find this very fitting in this setting because like Piper, many of the faces within this room and within the broader of epilepsy, the epilepsy community amazingly mask the difficulties and the challenges of our children and the struggles and the heartbreak that we all face as parents. Piper has been diagnosed with PCDH19 and to provide you all with a measured representation um, of the battle that she faces, I can inform you that over the last six to seven months, Piper has spent in excess of 60 nights in the ICU fighting the beast that we call epilepsy. Now, many weeks ago, I was approached by Danielle to speak today. At the time I was approached, we were going through a dark time. Our daughter Piper's epilepsy was far from being under control. We were literally living in the intensive care unit, repeatedly failing to successfully wean Piper off the midazolam infusion that was keeping her seizures at bay. We had three other children at home, all of whom needed us, but whom we struggled to reach, either in a physical sense or given that I'm here to be honest and open with you all, an emotional one. I was finding that even if I was physically present in the company of my other children, as they've become to be known, my mind, my heart, my soul, sorry, and my every thought was unable to be pulled away from Piper. I felt that my life was in tatters. I felt it was an utter mess. We were surviving through the skin of our teeth. So when I was approached by Danielle to speak today, I smiled, I sighed, <laughs> and I questioned what could I possibly offer you all as an inspiration when I myself felt as if I was down and out. I asked Danielle what she'd like me to focus on in, my, in today's talk. She assured me that we could go over that later. <laughs> <laughs> At which point I stated in tongue in cheek, well, we could always talk about how I managed to survive a chaotic life. <laughs> well, that talk with Danielle didn't actually happen. Um, and so you can imagine my surprise when, I, when the agenda is released. <laughs> and what on earth do I see? But here is Sarah Crawford talking about how she survives a life of chaos. <laughs> Thanks, Danielle. But the truth is, my life is chaotic. There is no denying it. And I have no doubt that many of you feel very much the same. How I survive is always preparing for the worst. It sounds dire, but it's true. It actually took me a long time to accept this truth. And I thought that in accepting this truth, I was accepting a feeling of hopelessness, a feeling of constant anxiety, and a negative thought pattern regarding Piper's condition and her future perspectives. But the truth is that accepting the worst case scenario was allowing me time to plan and to process and to respond in a forward thinking approach rather than simply by reacting in a knee jerk manner. As Professor Daniel Lowenstein said earlier today in his speech, we need to be prepared for the inevitable storm. This changing thinking is both relative to Piper's physical state of health and also to her evolving disabilities. I liken this mindful approach to having an emergency hospital bag packed and waiting at the front door. Do I have a hospital bag packed at my house? Absolutely. Do I know when the next seizure cluster is set to arrive and therefore sling us into a state of medical emergency? No, I don't. But does being prepared for this regardless 
make me a negative mother? No, it does not. It makes me a prepared one. One of the ways that I've tried to stay on the front foot of the life that we've been given is to maintain and encourage open and transparent dialogue with our treating physicians. No matter how dark the content of the conversation, it needs to be heard and it needs to be received. Due to the honesty and the openness offered by our teams, it also en enabled us to identify some of the barriers that we were facing in receiving and having access to top level care and epilepsy monitoring for Piper and for other children like her. And upon identifying these barriers, and despite initially feeling overwhelmed, my husband and myself chose a path of empowerment because feeling empowered helped us to cope. We learnt what services were required by our treating hospital and we put our advocacy hats on. We got loud and we started fundraising through the launch of our foundation, the Pipilepsy Foundation. That's our little logo there, Piper being the pip in Pipilepsy. As a result of our work, I'm proud to announce that we have now successfully advocated for and exclusively funded both the out of hours EEG monitoring service and the newly launched home video monitoring service at the Royal Children's Hospital, freeing up to, th up to three to four beds in the hospital per week, alleviating not only our family <coughs> stress regarding access to immediate EEG monitoring in emergency situations, but assisting many families like us and their children also. So that's my story um, and how we came about the launch of the foundation. Um, and, you know, I guess I want to touch on the fact that I've got this up here. It's not so you can simply all plug it into your, your phones and connect with us on Facebook. It's also symbolic of many things. And um, to me, it tells our story. Uh, one of the most pivotal points that stands out in our logo for us is our unicorn. And um, that's come as a direct consequence of Piper's, not diagnosis of PCDH19, but long before that when she was diagnosed with epilepsy. And the first thing I did was took myself off to a talk given by Ingrid at the Epilepsy Foundation, where Ingrid happened to just skim over this seemingly minor piece of information that ancient mythology states that the powder from the horn of the unicorn can cure epilepsy. So that's our icon. We hold it with all hope in our hearts. We'd love you all to join our fight, our battle. We're all in this together. And just on that note, um, I, I guess I want to speak to the founders of Getter here as well. Um, and to thank you all individually for what you've given not only us as a family, but many of us in, um, in this room. We were so isolated beforehand. And as a response of coming along to these conferences, I, I can say my heart's full. I've got Laylee, if you can stand up. <laughs> I've got Pip. Kylie, stand up, Kate, darling Kate, them. All these connections and support that are on the other end of the phone, the other end of the text message. They uh, deliver coffees up to ICU because, you know, I'm too frightened to come out. And it's just proven to be such a pivotal strength on so many different levels. And um, I guess as um, someone who's attended Getter from the beginning, I'd like to welcome everybody else and say, please use your supports. That's what's going to get you through. Thank you.